So we're here to celebrate our resident Lord. What makes it so significant? What makes it so special? You know, I don't think a human being can come up with the idea and the concept of the resurrection. It had to be a God idea from the beginning. It makes us different from all of the faiths, all of the founders and leaders of their faiths. They're in the grave. Most of them said statements like, I'm still looking for the truth. And uh, Jesus said it's finished when he died. I, the quote I put up there, you can put it back up again, but it made Ian Thomas. I want you to get the, the sequence. First of all, the life that Jesus lived qualified him for the death that he died, and that with his resurrection enabled us to live the life we were intended to live. Well, what is this life that we were intended to live? What's different about it? What makes it special? Well, if we go back to the garden, it's to restore that. It's what Adam and Eve had in the garden, where God would come and meet them in the afternoon, and they would walk, and they would fellowship. See, God created, he created us for fellowship with him. That's what we're designed for. I've, I've traveled the world a little bit, and, and the one thing that and when you look at all the different world religions and, and what they're doing, I mean, there is, a, there is something in them in all of us that we want to, we know that there's a God instinctively. We, we're looking for purpose and we're looking for meaning and we're looking for him. And most of the world's religions, in fact, all of them except Christianity and even some Christians, think that we have to do something. We have to arrange something. We got to get something right. We have to do it. It's on us to do that kind of stuff that to, so that we can have what was lost in the garden. God intended you and I to walk with him, to be like him, to look like him, to love like him. And so Jesus, the life that he lived, was the life that was lost in the garden. That Jesus, when he walked this earth, was different. In Philippians, the second chapter, starting in verse 6, you'll look at that real quickly. My favorite Bible passage Another favorite Bible passage. In the sixth verse in Philippians, and Paul had a unique relationship with the Philippian church. And, and, and the, the letter <clears throat> is a very positive, encouraging letter. And, and, and either he's affirming them in their faith or he's encouraging them in, in the situations that they're facing. But in the second chapter of Philippians, starting in the sixth verse, and this is a description of Jesus, and, the, and it says in the fifth verse, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now notice how different this is. Who, being the very nature of Christ, of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in the human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, and even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, we have God who is in heaven, we have Jesus who is in heaven, and Jesus comes to earth. And, and, and it says in First John, I mean John 1, that in the beginning there was God. And God, and God, and he dwelt with God. He said, well, let me read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus was in heaven, okay? We, they, he, he was part of the creative process. And he made man, and, and, and man rebelled against God and fell into sin. And, and the things we see in, going on in the world have been going on. You know, we, we sometimes think like what's going on in Ukraine and the atrocities and the terrible things is a new thing. Listen, folks, go back and read history. It ain't a new thing. Man's been really mean to man for a long, long time. That's because we're basically sinful. That sin started in the garden, and that sin has separated us from God. And, and so immediately, God already knew, so he had a plan. 
In the Old Testament, he extended his love and his grace to the nation of Israel through Abraham. And he constantly reached out to people. It didn't have to be Jews that he reached out to. Rahab wasn't a Jew, and she became a follower of God. But all throughout the Bible, we have these, that that God is reaching out and extending kindness and extending kindness. And when when the kindness didn't work and he exhausted that, then he would extend, extend judgment and punishment. At, at, at there's a New York Times, there's a, a columnist, a former, or at least a Jew, I'm, I'm not sure he's a liberal Jew, but he says we need to forget this concept of God. Wow. That's, what's, that's why the world's so messed up today. Read the headlines. You, you take God out of, and his rules and his laws and his ways of doing things, you take that out of our lifestyles, and look what happens. There are no laws, there are no rules, there, I mean, you, you can't even tell what is a man and a woman. We can't define those things because there's lawlessness. And yet, and yet what he's asking for, we're experiencing the heartache and the pain and the suffering that comes as a result of that. God was not satisfied, that, satisfied with that. For God so loved the Son that he gave his, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Put the second Ian Thomas quote out there. And this is the mission, Ian Thomas's way, he stated the mission. He came to this earth in the very fullness sense of the term. He became man. He became man as God intended man to be and behaved as God intended man to behave. Walking day by day in the relationship to the Father, which God has always intended that should exist between man and God. Sometimes we think we seek that relationship, but it's God who seeks the relationship more than we do. It is God who desires to meet you in the morning when you get up and to visit with him. It is God who desires to share his heart with you. And sometimes I get out ahead of him, and I'm just so full of my stuff that I forgot who I was talking to. But this is what Jesus' ministry and purpose, and when he came to this earth, he demonstrated it through his activities. This Jesus who walked on the water. Man, you imagine those disciples. I mean, they were poor boys. They were confused for three years, I think. And then, and then that, that same Jesus would be raising the dead. Then he would do what nobody else did. He would go to a leper, and the leper would be calling unclean, unclean, or, or have mercy on me or something like that. You're not supposed to touch him because you could get it. And leprosy was the end. You were segregated. You were cast off from your family, your friends, to suffer that miserable death that came, a long, slow death that came as leprosy. And, and, and most of the people believed that those people were lepers, and they suffered that disease because of some sin in their life or their parents' life. So they got what they deserved. They just, you leave them alone. They don't. And here comes Jesus. And his poor old confused disciples are watching him. And he goes and he touches them. And he, he lays hands on him, and he's not afraid of him. And he, where everybody else, they walk through him and don't see him, Jesus sees him. And he loves him and has compassion on him. The same Jesus who walked in the water, who, who, who wept at Lazarus' grave and showed that emotion there, that human emotion, is the same uh, Jesus that stood up and said to the storm, peace, be still, and the storm immediately stops. There's a... There's a visual Bible, I think is what it's called. And, and, and it's, I mean, it's, you know, we read the, the scriptures, but we don't see facial expressions and we don't see emotions displayed. And the Bible doesn't give, go into a lot of detail about that stuff. But in this one particular story, this, this dad had this son. It was the one where the dad had the son and he was demon possessed. And he would throw himself into fits or the demon would throw him into fits and, you know, he would beat himself up. And, and, and they showed the dad's concern and him begging Jesus to help his son. And I never really thought about that until I saw that. What if you had a son and he'd run himself against the wall and he would cut himself and he would just be completely out of control and foam at the mouth? The same Jesus, he wasn't intimidated or afraid or scared of it. Why? Because he was living the life he was, that we were intended to live. He was walking with, with God. 
He was aware of God's presence. He, he, he could see where God was working. He, you know, I, I get up in the morning, and I have my quiet time, and then I go through the day, and I ignore Jesus, the Holy Spirit, most of the day. And it just kills me. Every, and every day, Lord, I'm, forgive me. And every day, Jesus never got to the point where he wasn't in the presence of God, and he, that he could see things, and he understood things because, because he had God's presence so real in his life. And here this, here this, guy, this dad is with this kid, a teenager probably, that was just destroying himself, just flat destroying himself. What sin does? And so Jesus comes. The disciples try to do it, and they fail. Can you imagine the dad? Here are these followers of Jesus. I've heard such good things about Jesus. I've heard him do so many wonderful things and everything like that. And his disciples said they can help. Oh, I'm so excited. And what happens? His heart's broken. And then Jesus comes, and he casts a demon out of his son. And all of a sudden, for the first time in a long, long, maybe forever, the son is normal. The son looks up and sees his dad, and his dad sees him. Man, what a Jesus, huh? He lived the life that we were, that's the life we're intended to live, to bring hope and care and concern to people. The same Jesus who could cast out that demon and make the storms stop would bend down and wash the feet of his disciples. Same Jesus did all that stuff, played with kids. You know, I'm convinced that Jesus was a happy, smiling, good guy. Because you children's workers know that kids don't like grumps. They don't like serious-minded people that, or, that frown or concern or or no motion or whatever. I mean, this, there were some pencil, pen and ink drawings, or pencil drawings that were about uh, years ago, and it was these pictures of Jesus and the kid with the kids. And one time, a little girl sitting on his lap, and the, and, and a kid was draped over his shoulder, and and I mean he would, I mean, the, and the disciples thought, oh, these, this is such a waste of time. Tell these kids, just chase these kids off, you know. And Jesus wouldn't have any of it. Man, he was different, wasn't he? He was living the life that God intended for us to live. He was going through and equipping his disciples for their mission, for his mission. And when they came back, he celebrated with them. He cried with them. He celebrated with them. He he, uh, corrected them. There was really no one like him, the God-man. The life he lived... When you read through the Gospels, just put yourself, that's what God intended for me to be like. He intended me to be like Jesus. You know what the cool thing is? Is you go to the New Testament, and you see Paul, and you see Peter. We talked about it in Sunday school a little bit this morning, about how different Peter was as a result of being filled. We didn't read it this morning, but it was in a passage in connection with it. That, that, the, the, that the, the priest and the Sanhedrin, was, they were shocked at these ignorant fishermen. They, were, they had no education. They had no schooling. They had nothing special about them. They were just working class folks. And yet they were amazed because of their courage, because of the way they could defend themselves. And the answer was they had been with Jesus. Well, that is a partially true statement. Their conclusion was partial. They had been with Jesus, but guess what? They were still with him. And he lived in them the life we were intended to live. The second one is, is remembering the death that he died. The life he lived made him eligible to die the death that he died. It allowed him to die the death that he died. You see, the thing is, I didn't, I didn't live the life that God, that Jesus lived, and you didn't either. We haven't lived up to that. We have sinned. We have fallen short. We have not made that standard. So I can't die for you. I'm in need of that for myself. But Jesus did. This God-man was completely obedient even to death and even death on the cross. You know, this was done at Passover time. The Passover lamb, remember the story in the Old Testament? That the nation of Israel was in bondage. And they were, and they were for years and years and years, they just suffered. And it got harder and harder. And God sent Moses and Moses came in, and they did the plagues. And the last plague was the plague of the, 
of the, the death angel, we call it. But in other words, that, that what they had to do is they had to go out and to save your firstborn son, wages of sin is death, and in this case, the death would be the firstborn. And, if, and what you would do is you would take and you would kill the lamb, you would prepare the meal as was instructed by Moses and Aaron, and then you would sit in your house and, and take the blood, and when you, you catch the blood in a, in, a, in a basin or a pot, and then take the blood and spread it on the doorpost, just around, around the, the support structure of the door right there, and it'd be on your front door. When the angel would come through, if you saw the blood, and your house was covered by the blood, and it passed on by, but if it wasn't, the firstborn of your child, your children, your animals, they would die. The firstborn was, the, was also used in sacrifices, but, 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 but this is Passover. Now that lamb that was perfect, that unblemished lamb that they were to, 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 to sacrifice that day was a picture of the Jesus that would come. We saw a picture of it with Abraham and Isaac. We talked about that, I think, a couple of weeks ago, that Isaac would submit himself carry the burden of the, of, the, of the fire and of the wood and stuff, and then he would submit himself to his father as Jesus submitted himself to his father. In that case, there was another sacrifice, and the son didn't die. In this case, the son died. So we're going to observe the Lord's Supper today. We want us to remember, he said to do this, and when you do this, remember me. And I think we need to remember the life he lived, but also the death that he died, because the blood and the bread the, is, is symbolic of that, of what he gave. Jesus went through a trial. He went to Ananus and Caiaphas, who were the priestly class. He was brought before Herod. Herod put a purple robe on him and a crown of thorns on him and beat him pretty hard. Then he went to Pilate. Pilate beat him with a cat of nine tails or had his soldiers do that. They mocked him. They hit him in the face and said, and they covered his eyes and said, if you're, if you're a prophet, then tell us who hit you. And he never said anything. In the end, he, his blood was poured out. The payment for sin is blood. Now, what, in the Jewish mindset, blood represented life. And, of course, it is a living fluid. I mean, it's got life in the fluid that goes through your body, and if you don't have blood, you don't have life. And a whole, a whole circulatory system is built around that fact. And so he said, it's my body which is broken for you and my blood which is shed for you. We remember what Jesus went through to pay the price for our sin. For, the, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means all of us in this room. And the, and the wages of sin is death, and so we should collect that paycheck of, of death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus and the sacrifice that he paid. Listen to 1 Corinthians 11, 27 verse. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eats and drinks judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will, will not finally be finally condemned with the world. And so we, we, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And it says don't, you don't eat or drink of it in an unworthy manner. What does that mean in an unworthy manner? Well, if you've never accepted the free gift of salvation that was bought and paid for by the blood of Christ, that's unworthy. You, are not, you have nothing to remember in that light. Because the, the personal experience, that, the deal about, about how that, that we will not be, that we are to survive and we're to be children of God as comes about as a result of our sins being paid for by the blood. If you have not accepted the free gift of salvation by Jesus, then you have never accepted the sacrifice that he's offered. And that's an unworthy manner. So it's important that you be born again, that you be saved. That you have willful, un, unconfessed sin in your life. 
That's an area of your life that you are rebelling. Now, all of us are sinners. The, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So in the definition of, that he gave of sin is falling short of God's glory. On your best day, on my best day, I never, ever have done anything like, like God would do it. I just can't. I'm not capable of that. I got me here. And me stops that stuff. So we can't, we, and, if, and I mean, if you got too pure on this, we couldn't do it. But it's willful sin. It's in, in a state of rebellion. You're living in a relationship that's not according to God. Uh, you're, you're stealing from the, the God, whatever. You've got some sin in your life that you've got anger against somebody else that you, that you just hold on to. You're not discerning the body of Christ. I think that's fe fe feeling that you don't need God his sacrifice, his church, are proud and self-sufficient. I think that means. The other deal is not paying attention and making light of the event. Judgment comes on you if you, if you do that. And so we want now the deacons to come forward. And we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. That night, before that he was arrested before that he met with his disciples we've talked about it a little bit and he wrote you know um, he got his disciples together he, wa he washed their feet and at the end of the supper he, he took he took the bread and said this is my body which is broken for you he is and this is my blood which is shed for you he is predicting his death in just a week and so guys Today, we remember that death. Okay, guys, you can pass it out.
That night, he took the bread. It was unleavened bread, according to the Passover laws and rules. And he broke the bread, and he passed it out to his disciples. This is my body, which is broken for you. But, you know, I, I kind of see a symbolism that we are the body of Christ now. That, because that little piece you hold came part of a bigger loaf. We to remember that he allowed the suffering. Now, what, what was all that suffering about with his body? The ridicule? I mean, there was emotional suffering that took place. There was physical suffering that took place. That's part of the wages of sin. The thing is, is sin, and we collect the wage of sin, it just doesn't end when you die. He makes you miserable till you die. That's the devil's plan. That's what he loves. The guilt, the shame, all that was placed on Jesus. He was hung naked. Can you imagine? No dignity in that. And then, of course, the physical, painful. We, we see people all the time who have surrendered their bodies to sin. And we can tell it by the way we look at them. They're deteriorating. They're aging. It's miserable. This is my body. He's saying, I'm taking all of that, all that junk that you got, and I'm taking it on myself. Justin, pray for us, brother, and thank God that he, he took that for us. Take on all of our sin. God, that you would break your body for everything that I've done. Everything that we have done. In Jesus' name we pray. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat it. next part of the supper was out of the wine or the juice. As the Passover lamb protected the home, the Bible says there's no, there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. That's the way it was set up. And all the sacrifices, the blood sacrifice of the Old Testament, the sin offerings of the Old Testament, were picturing this event. And they stuck that spear in his side and blood and water came out. His life poured out for me and you. David, would thank God that he gave his life as a sacrifice for us. Thank you so much for dying on the cross, Father. <coughs> giving your life for us, Father. And today we remember you, Father. We remember that you first paid the price on the cross, Father, and then you rose again, Father, that we may have life eternal. Father, thank you so much for that sacrifice. We pray this in Christ's name. This is my blood which is poured out for you. Take and drink it. Leon. The life he lived and enabled him to die the death that he died for us to live the life we were intended to live. And the first thing I think of in that, I think we're, we're forgiven. God did not intend us to go burdened down and in bondage of sin, the consequences of sin, we're forgiven. I, I, I put together some, some, some of my favorite verses on forgiveness. Isaiah 118, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scar like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are like red, like crimson. They shall be like wool. In Micah 7, 19, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103, 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Jeremiah 31, 34. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. For the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. 
1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The one thing I know as sure as I'm standing here is that you struggle with guilt for the things you've done in the past. You know how I know that? I do too. Man, wouldn't you like to, and the older we get, the more we got to regret. Now, that's better than the alternative, not getting old, but But see, you know, and, and, and I'll beat myself up and I'll try to pay for those sins and I'll try to, what well, you know, I can't. The truth is, I mean, stop and think of the concept, but God looks at you. He doesn't see what you did in 1988. He doesn't see what you did last week if you're in him. You have a relationship with Almighty God where he is your father and you are his child. Look at your own children. Do you stop and think what they did when they were seven years old? I remember that time he was at school and he pooped in his pants and I've never forgiven him since. No, I was the one that did that. Never mind. (laughs) We don't do that, do we? Well, man, he's so much better than we are. He doesn't see that anymore. That just, that, that doesn't make any sense. But God is not like us in that way. No matter how far we go, the prodigal son, man, no matter how far that guy went, when he came home, Dad, that's the past, partner. If we see a picture of him throwing in that deep part of the ocean or separating as far as the east is from the west, man, don't let, if Satan can get you guilty, if your own nature can can slow you down that way, it's going to happen. You don't have to live away. When the life we are intended to live as children who have been sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus and we can walk boldly into the presence of God. That's the big change. That's the really big change. That's the life we were intended to live. Often picture what it was like in, when kings were on the throne. And, of course, in the olden days like this, uh, before in the Old Testament especially, if you were a king and somebody came in and you didn't want to see him, you, you, if you didn't raise your scepter, the story of Esther, you, they'd have died. Now, if it was your kid, especially if you're four or five years old, and they come running up and jumping on dad's lap in the throne, dad ain't doing nothing like that. That's the way the Father wants us to see him. Our dad, who's excited when he sees us. He looks to have fellowship with us. The life we were intended to live is to walk in fellowship with God and fellowship with each other. To love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and your neighbors, yourself. That we obey the Great Commission. As the Father is sending me, it says in John, so I am sending you. And we saw that, and we're going to talk about that in future sermons. That we're partners with him. That's the life we were intended to live on his grand and glorious mission. And we have a mission. Restore what was lost in the garden. Or to take up your cross and follow me. There's a song, an old hymn. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast save the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See him with his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. We've reminded ourselves of this, the cross and what Jesus did. Let me ask you a question. Have you accepted his sacrifice, his expensive, generous sacrifice? To take your sins to a point where he doesn't remember anymore. To give you a home in heaven. 
if you've done that, would, would, and part of doing this in remembrance of me, would you remember that? Go back to that time in your life, however you were, 50, nine, whatever age you were, where you gave your heart and your life to Jesus. He had arranged all the events that were to take place before. He arranged that divine appointment. Remember that. You're forgiven. You're his child. If you haven't done that, would you tell him right now, Lord, I've never done that, but I want that. I don't see how you can forgive me, but I want your forgiveness. I accept your promise. Maybe, maybe there's some sin in your life that need, needs to be gotten rid of so that you can have fellowship with him. Your relationship is there. You've, you've been made his child. You've been adopted as his child, but you haven't had fellowship with him because you're holding on to something else and not him. Give that up right now, too. He'll take it. Father, these are your people. We are your body. You've allowed us to remember you today. You've allowed us to remember your sacrifice. Lord, you've, you've shown us that we have a life to live, a life that you intended for us, an abundant life, a hopeful life. Lord, I pray that in this time of decision that we'll say yes to you, whatever it is, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?